Hello my friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. And uh, I come out here on Friday nights with uh, my brother John and brother Brett. And we have, we've come down here this specific day to preach the gospel of grace to you, to bring to you the gospel of salvation. My friends, we're here to tell you about Jesus Christ, who is the Lord who saves from sin. We want to warn you about your sin, to warn you about God's judgment against you and your sin, but that you can have freedom, you can have salvation in Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved, other than the name of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. Philippians 2 tells us that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the, the sovereign ruler. He is the, the, the King of glory. And He reigns. We're here not to show any distinction when it comes to our calling out sin, but to call sin out for what it is. And we're here to do that because we care for you, because we do not want you to perish in your sins. We don't want you to die in your sins. For we know the Bible says if you die in your sins, you will, you will go to hell. You'll go to the place of torment. And we do not want that for you. Instead, we want you to go to heaven. We want you to be reconciled with God. We want you to enter into glory through the through the, through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so friends, we are going to try our best by the mercies of God and myself specifically now during this time, I'm going to try my best by the mercy of God to make much of sin, to make much of the bad news so that I might make much of Christ and make much of the good news. That I might bring the good news of the gospel to this darkened place and to darkened hearts. Friends, the Bible says that sinners have darkened hearts, depraved minds, and they need to be raised to spiritual life. People are dead in sin, Ephesians 2.1. If you're outside of Christ, you're dead in sin. But friends, my, my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, seeks and saves those who are lost. My Lord is in the business of raising people from the dead. He has the power to do that, to raise dead sinners from their stupor of sin and transgression and iniquity and raise them to spiritual life to serve the living God. Praise God for that. I'm out here to tell you about Christ's work at the cross, His atoning work at the cross, His resurrection, His intercession that He is the great high priest, that He is the great high priest forever, never to die again. He has died once for sin and He will never die again. No other man could say what Jesus said and do what Jesus did. And He was not merely a prophet, not merely even the Son of God, but He was Almighty God, the second person of the Trinity, in human flesh, dwelling among men. It's God among men. See, all of the religions, the religions of the world say, try to work your way to God by by your own merits, try to work your way up to God. Reconcile yourself to your Creator. But the, the faith according to Scripture, the biblical Christianity says God has condescended. God has come and has dwelt among men. And praise God for that. Praise God that He has done that. Praise God that Jesus Christ has come. I love the words of Matthew 1 when the angel tells Joseph in his dream, he says, And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He is the only Savior, Christ the Lord. And dear friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to look at is in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. And the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 says this, and where this verse sits, just to make a note on it, where this verse sits in Romans chapter 1, Paul is describing, he is describing people who reject the gospel and who turn from the God of glory, who turn from the God of Scripture. He is describing those who find themselves living in rebellion to God. And this is what he says in verse 
I'll actually start in verse 24. He says, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And then verse 26, For this reason God gave them over to, a, to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, the men also abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And friends, uh, by the grace of God, I've been going through, each time I preach in the open air, Romans 1, and I've preached on many things in this chapter. It covers a plethora of topics, but here we come upon a very sensitive issue. The issue of homosexuality. That's a very, very sensitive issue in the United States today, in our culture. It was something that even a few decades ago wasn't so much of an issue, but now it is very much a sensitive issue. And I seek to address it according to how Scripture addresses it, in the way in which the Bible describes it, and to do so in a way that honors the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ which certainly makes much of the sin that it is and exposes it for what it is and calls it out for what it is, but points to the Savior who saves from it. In fact, it breaks my heart to know there are many self-dubbed open-air preachers who will stand on street corners and preach about homosexuality and things like that. They'll talk about those things but they do so in a way that never reveals the gospel and never points the sinner to Christ. It never re reveals to the, the lost soul the gospel of grace. And so what the sinner is left in is in a state of... God bless you, sir. The sinner is left in a state of hopelessness because all the, all the, the self-claimed street preacher does is just expose the sin and never shows the Savior. It's as foolish as a doctor. It's as foolish as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone who would claim to be a medical doctor showing their patients the diseases and the ailments which they have and going to great detail to explain how bad those diseases and ailments are, but never giving them treatment options, never giving them the cure to their diseases. It's a foolish endeavor. And so, yes, I make much of sin so that I might make much of my Savior. That I might exalt my Savior. I might exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't make much of Christ if you do not take the time and make much of sin in what it is. And so with that said, I'll address this sensitive topic of homosexuality from the Scriptures from the Scriptures. And just to note, what is the context here in Romans 1? What's Paul's argument here in Romans chapter 1? Well, he says in verse 16 and 17, he says these words, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. My friends, the Gospel is the only means of salvation. It's the only way someone can be reconciled to God is by believing the good news of Jesus Christ. And he says that, and even in verse 17, he says, For in it, that is the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, you receive the righteousness of Christ by faith, as a gift of faith, gift righteousness. And that's the heart of the Christian message, that salvation is a gift of grace, not something that is merited by work. And so Paul sets that forth as his thesis statement for the book of Romans. It's what he's going to spend the rest of the book explaining and expounding upon. It's what he's going to, to spend the rest of these, these chapters telling us about. But before he brings the good news, before he brings the good news of what Jesus Christ has done, he must... He must, as a preacher of the gospel, be faithful to preach the bad news. And that's why in the very next verse, in verse 18, listen to what he says. This is how he begins. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed 
from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident for, uh, it, within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. In other words, Paul is saying every person on the face of the earth knows the God of glory. They know His existence. They know who He is. They know His attributes and they know His nature. But they suppress that truth in their sin, in their love for their unrighteousness. There is no one ignorant of God's existence. There's no one. There's no such thing as an atheist. There's no such thing as someone who is ignorant of God's existence or who genuinely does not have enough evidence for the existence of the God of glory. Everyone knows. Everyone is without excuse. That's what the text says. They are without excuse. And so it continues on. At verse 21 it says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That is where we find our society today, friends. We find a post-Christian society that rejects any even any notion of a higher being let alone the god of scripture and so where we find ourselves is in an idolatrous land this land is filled with idol worshipers and idols whether it be cars whether it be money whether it be sex whether it be drinking whether it be relationships whatever it is people worship things rather than the one who made those things they worship the creation rather than the Creator. That is where we find ourselves as a society. It breaks my heart to know that. God bless you folks. So, thank you so much. I encourage my heart. Verse 24, listen to what he says. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And I talked about last week, I, I preached... Um, I think it was from this very passage last week about how God, there is a certain point in which men will reject the God of glory. They will turn their backs from the God of Scripture and He will let them up to what they so desire to do. He will allow them... He will. You see, here's the thing, dear friends. Here's something I want you to understand. God is restraining evil right now, even in your own hearts. He's restraining the evil of my heart you ask yourself, why is it that you are not, why is it that you're not this gang-banging murderer? Why are you not as bad as other people? It's because God is restraining the evil of your heart. It's not because you're good. It's not because you're inherently better than people. It's because God in His mercy is restraining the evil of your heart. And my friends, God restrains the evil of men's hearts. And I praise Him that He does that. Because if He didn't, we probably wouldn't be alive. There'd be absolute chaos. But God restrains the evil of men's hearts. But there comes a point where they will resist His authority. They will resist His Lordship. They will set themselves up against the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He lets them up to do that which they so desire. He lets them up to live in the sin which they so love. That's why it says in verse 25, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. They are idol worshippers. They worship things that are not God. Or they perhaps say, Well, I worship the God of the Bible, but it is not the God of the Bible they worship. Perhaps they're like a lot of Southern Baptist Christians are, and I can say, Christians, quote and unquote, and I can say that I'm a Southern Baptist pastor, so I'll say that. And they say they're Christians, but instead, instead they make an idol in their own mind that suits their own desires, suits their own, uh, their own passions, and he looks more like a genie in the bottle or some grandfather floating in the sky who's just willing to pour out blessing upon people. That's not the God of Scripture. It is true that God is gracious and compassionate, abounding in loving kindness, the Bible says in, in 1 John. I don't think bashing homosexuals shows grace. Oh man, well the Bible, this is what yeah, the Bible says. I, I'd love I'm to have a discussion what, with you. I'm going to pray for you. 
Yes. Are you a believer? I'm a believer, big time. I, oh, okay. So you believe in the? Do you believe in the Bible? I believe in Jesus Christ, and what you're doing is so sad. I'd love to. I'd love to have a discussion. I would. I don't think bashing homosexuality is going to bring you to Christ. Ma'am, that. Do you believe what the Bible says? You need to be saved. You need to be saved from hypocrisy. <laughs> really. Jesus said, "Many will say to me on the day of judgment." Lord, Lord, and he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness. You're goats. You're not sheep. You're, you're goats among the sheep. You need to be saved. Please be reconciled to God. Well, the wicked flee when no one is pursuing. I'm not, I, I ask them to discuss, discuss with me Scripture. You can't say you believe in Jesus Christ and have no basis for it. So either you're going to say, I believe the Scripture, I don't believe the Scripture, and therefore don't say you believe in Jesus Christ. The Word of God is the only infallible, inspired, and errant rule of faith for the church, and it is sufficient. Sufficient for all that is necessary for a life of godliness. And I will, I will stand upon that to the day I die. The Word of God is sufficient. The Word of God is sufficient. Apparently not to that woman. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no in between. That's exactly right. That's why Jesus said, you are either for me or you're against me. You're either, and that's a good point I'll bring up. Dear friends, you are either the friend of God or you're the enemy of God. There's no in between. There is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. You're either with Him or you're against Him. That's it. That's, that's where you stand. Tonight you either stand beloved of God in the kingdom of God and a child of God or you're the child of the devil and you're an enemy of God. And I want you to become the friend of God through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Don't trample the blood of the Lamb underfoot, dear friends. Don't reject Christ. Don't reject the gospel. The gospel of grace. So Paul says these words, and then we come and we find ourselves in verse 26, which I said earlier touches upon this very sensitive issue. And it's interesting, the woman never, she didn't let me finish what I was going to say. She never st stayed around to hear what the whole point of this is. She never stayed around to hear me bring it to the foot of the cross. It's a shame, really. And so Jesus said in, in John 7, He challenged the Jews, He said, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Friends, examine what I'm saying. Test it against the Word of God to see if it is true, to see if it is final, and to see if it is absolute. And I'm confident that it will be found to be true. But nonetheless, verse 26, which is where we will be spending a lot of our time, verses 26 and 27 this evening. And that covers this issue of homosexuality. Verse, six, uh, verse 26, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. As we already talked about, the previous verses already spoke to this effect that God lets people up to do with that, that which they so desire. It says they're degrading passions. In other words, they bring them into a, a horrible state. It's a very negative, a very strong word he uses here, degrading. It brings them to a horrible state. And he says, for their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. And it's very clear what Paul's referencing here, especially in the context, writing to the believers at Rome, homosexuality being such a prevalent issue, such a prevalent sin in Rome. And it is a sin. It is a sin in the eyes of God. Just like lying is a sin in the eyes of God. Just like thievery is a sin in the eyes of God. It is sinful in God's eyes to do such things. And that is why salvation through Christ is necessary. Because of sin. Because of sinners needing a Savior. Listen to what he says in verse 27. He says, And in the same way, also the men abandon the natural function of the woman. I just want to stop there. Dear friends, God condemns homosexuality in His Word. He condemns it in written Scripture. But there's not only that do we have as our rule concerning these things, but it is nature itself. Nature itself teaches us concerning these things. That is, that, that is unnatural. It is against nature. 
And so there's something particularly dangerous and something particularly deadly about sexual sin, just in generality, not just homosexuality, but any sexual sin. Because the Bible talks about sexual sin in, the, in this way. It says it's a sin against one's own body. Because it, it destroys and it, it diminishes God's original intent for the man and woman. That sexual intimacy is only to be enjoyed and only to be to be experienced in in the context of a, a one man and a one woman marriage. That's the way God created it to be because it reflects the gospel. It reflects the gospel message. Marriage is a reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. My friends, the, the gospel message is, is revealed and it is displayed in marriage. When a husband is loving his wife selflessly, and when a, and when, when a, when a wife is submitting to her husband's authority biblically, that is a, an image of the gospel message of Christ loving His bride and the bride of Christ loving her husband. That is the, that's why marriage is so important and so glorious. Because it is God-exalting, it is God-centered, it is gospel-centered, it's rich in gospel truth. And so to pervert it, to pervert marriage, is to pervert the image of the gospel. It is to desecrate something which has been declared by God as holy. Which is, and it is something which is the, the pinnacle and the, and the cornerstone of society as a whole. We know obviously society is built on family units and a family unit can only start when one man and one woman come together in matrimony and beget children. That's the only way a family can be built. A family that is, that is conducted and done in a way which is honoring to God. And so that is the reason why a homosexual marriage is an abomination in God's eyes. It is because marriage itself is something that is holy in God's eyes and it reflects the glorious gospel message of Jesus Christ. And it says they burn in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And dear friends, that's what I want to say, is sin. Sin brings about wrath. Sin brings about judgment. When you sin against God, you are incurring His wrath upon your life. Dear friends, do not die in your sins. Don't perish in your sins and your iniquity. This sin, it brings about wrath. And specifically, as we're looking in verse 27, this sin of homosexuality is bringing upon people God's wrath. I don't want you to die in your sins. Be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved from this perverse and wicked generation we find ourselves in. Oh, dear friends, and there's not only that, but there's more sexual perversion happening. I just, uh, what was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, the whole thing with Target, allowing men and women to go into the other restroom. What a perversion, what a disgusting perversion. But that is what, that is what results from a depraved mind, as it says in the text. Their minds are depraved. People are confused as to what gender they are because they have depraved minds. They don't need therapy. They don't need to do a gender change. They need to be saved through Jesus Christ. They need to be born again. Dear friends, I had a depraved mind. I was dead in sin, but Christ raised me to spiritual life. Saved me from my sin. My friends, Christ can save you from your sins. Oh, this, this man has a, a shirt that says Israel. Shalom Israel. Peace be upon Israel. Peace be upon the Israel of God. The church is the Israel of God. Praise, praise God for that. But dear friends, these are things which earn the wrath of God. This sin, this sin of homosexuality brings the wrath of God. Just as verse 18 reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. It is not only these sexual sins which are evil in God's eyes, but fornication. If you fornicate, you are a sinner in the eyes of God. You need to be saved through Jesus Christ. Fornication earns God's wrath. 
pornography. Jesus said if you look at a woman with lust for her, you commit adultery in the heart. God condemns adultery. And many people say, I've never committed that. But Jesus says in Matthew 5, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. My friends, God sees your mind. He sees your heart. He sees your depraved heart, your depraved mind. He sees that you're dead in sin. You're hostile to God. You're in the flesh. And you cannot please God. That is the state of someone who is outside of Christ. No neutrality. No middle ground. Either enemy of God or friend of God. And that's one of the only, either one of those places. That's it. As it says, and they receive in their own persons the due penalty of their error. But I've spoken so much on God's righteousness and referenced God's wrath multiple times. What do I mean when I say God? Amen. Who specifically am I referencing? I am speaking of the God of glory. Speaking of the God of Scripture. His name is Yahweh. He is the Creator. He is the Maker and the Sustainer of all things. That is the God of whom I am preaching and of whom, of whom I am speaking. The God who has made everything. Everything that you see out here this evening. Gorgeous night it is in Greenville tonight. Everything out here testifies to the glory of God. That God has a particular beauty about Himself. In fact, there's, there's certainly nothing like the Lord. There's no one like the Lord. And there's nothing that can compare to His beauty. In fact, uh, the Psalms speak to this very well in Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, the psalmist says in verse 1, the heavens are declaring, or excuse me, are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. My friends, all of creation speaks to the, the, the glory, the weightiness of God's beauty. God is a holy God. That's another aspect of God's character that you must understand. Dear friends, to understand the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must understand the righteousness of God. That God is a holy and just God. Talk the judge about the Holy Spirit. I want to know about the Holy Spirit. What would you like to know, sir? Hey. I don't want to hear the verbiage. I want to feel the power. In term what do you what do you mean? Hey, come on, man. Jesus walked in the spirit of the mm -hmm. Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Have it's you been born? Have you been born by the Spirit? You've been born again. Oh, absolutely, hundred percent. You've been you've been born again. Absolutely, one hundred percent. But the Bible says if you've been born again, you'll bear fruit of that. Have you borne fruit of that in your life? Absolutely, hundred percent. I own a multi-million dollar business. I started hey, with a wheelbarrow right. and, and, a and hardly nothing. We gave it a shot. Let's go. But I want to know about the Holy Spirit. Hey, John, do you have a couple? Of, or Brett, do you have a couple of golf yeah, hey, let's go. Let's go. No, I'm good. I'm good. No, we're, we're good. Fine. No, we're good. We're fine. We're late, no, I'm good. I'm good. I, I'm good. Look, but I want to know about the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about, I want to feel the power instead of talking about the power. I want to feel the electric instead of talking about well, the electric. Well, the thing is, is uh, I'm not a Pentecostal, <laughs> and uh, none of that stuff happens. That, that, that's not what the Holy, Holy Spirit's office is to reveal to sinners the glory of Christ. No, it's kind of, it's kind of sick. Absolutely. That's why you need to be saved. That's why you need to be saved from your sins. That's why all people need to be saved from their sins. If, 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 Through Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit was with you right now, the people walking by you would would be manifested in the Spirit instead of talking at them. What do you mean by manifest in the Spirit? Manifest, manifestation of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. Absolutely. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, understanding, and self-control. Yeah, and I come out here because I love these people. I'm preaching because I'm joyful about the gospel, and I could go on and on and on through the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, hopefully, by the grace of God, you, you see the fruit of the Spirit exhibited here in this time, because we love people. We do not want people to go to hell in their sins. We want the people to be saved from their sin. I know, um, but everywhere Jesus went, there were signs of miracles. 
Exactly, and we can get into a good discussion about that, but this it just doesn't happen anymore. That does not no, happen. No, it does. It does. That's where you're wrong, brother. No, no. That's where the Holy Spirit comes into place yep. because the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit inspired this, and He blesses the preaching of this. Maybe. He does. He does. But the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy all Spirit. The books that, go, that go into that book. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible's in? Yes, I believe that I'm led to the scripture I'm supposed to read. But you know, we're, brother, baptized church, we're baptized by fire. We're baptized by fire. Can you guys talk with them? I'm going to continue to preach. Yeah. I would I would talk with you guys. I'm oh, yeah, preaching. Yeah, it's okay. No, no, my friends, I, I don't want you guys to leave. The devil always runs away no, no, we want to talk to you, though. So, yeah. Why are you leaving, then? Because you said you, you couldn't talk to me. I know. I, can, I have to continue to preach, but I, I mean, my friends are here I to talk with you. I was walking by you. I was lighting a cigarette, and you said that I was not a Christian I, I tell you something, I was brother. lighting a cigarette. I want to tell you something. I don't think I've ever called out anyone for lighting a cigarette. Think, hey, yeah, you called me let out. Let me tell you something. I re, no, I really don't think I've ever said that. That's what distorts God's teaching. Like, God's love, you know? Yeah. John 3, 16, for God's so love. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing you need to convey right here is God's love to them. Yeah, so if they're going to hell, what was the most loving thing I can do? Dude, why do you think it's such a loving Yeah, if someone's going to hell, what was the most loving thing? The, 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 the grace and the mercy of God. Like, why would you just say If someone's, that? let me ask you, if someone's on their way to hell, what's the most loving thing I can do well, for How do you not know if you're on the way to hell? Oh, because Jesus Christ has saved me from okay, my sin. Okay, he saved everybody else too. Everybody no, they're not. That's universalism. That's not what the Bible teaches. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jesus, well, Jesus that's says that's what the Roman Catholic Church decided on what they put in that. You know? No, see, that's the thing. This, is, this came together before the Roman Catholic Church was even uh, in existence. Actually, it was actually the last, the New Testament, Old Testament was combined. You haven't done your history, buddy, because in 17, what? No, no, 18 something, I forget. 18? 1800. 1800? Like the Roman Catholic Church, nine men came together and decided what all goes in the New Testament, Old Testament. So you Friend, you're, you're very wrong in your history. No, actually, this, has been, this has been around since, actually since the books were even written. No, it actually it hasn't. Brother, actually, you should read the uh, Aramaic. You version. should preach with love, not fire and brimstone. Yeah, not fire and brimstone. It's love now, brother. What did Jesus talk? Did, did Jesus? Brother. Which one did Jesus talk about more, heaven or hell? Okay, good, thank you. He talked about it's heaven. heaven. Oh, hell. Yes. I really appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Don't feed into the. Let's go. Let's go. I'm good, man. I'm my own guy. I know. I understand. <laughs> but let us go. Uh, what did you say, who did you say was being here before the uh, Catholic Church? What's that? Who did you say was around before the Catholic Church? Oh, he was saying the the Bible was put together by the Roman Catholic Church. So oh. I said, no, it's been here long before hey, the sir, Catholic Church uh, was around. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank Good you. Good luck with it. Thank you. God bless right, you guys. You. Don't be afraid yeah. to steal a conversation from me, because I I, yeah. I think typically I want to focus on yeah. preaching. Yeah. So yeah, don't be afraid to come on in don't be afraid okay. to insert okay. yourself and and really cut I me want, off i want to stay away i was just trying to, that's good yeah, yeah. no you're, you're very gracious your preaching is very very i'm amazed it's supernatural it's very gracious thank you brother god bless you thank you brother oh what's what's that? oh that's for you ma'am no no it's for you i swear it's for you no it really is you we, we say that because we want you to be saved we want you to become a believer in jesus christ how long have you been a believer for How long have you been believer, like believing on Christ? Oh, since I was born. I, I know, I'm going to let these guys do it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's go back to preaching. Um, but just so, dear friends, as I was saying, God is a holy God. He's the creator of all things. And what it means to be holy, what, what that means to be, to be holy is to be sanctified, to be set apart. God is set apart from that which is evil. He is set apart from that which is wicked. Everything that is wrong, everything that is perverse, everything that is, that is in any way defiled, God is separated from that. Friends, I want you to get this. I want you to understand this about God. Sin cannot dwell in His presence. The evildoer cannot approach God because He is holy. He is a holy God. And that is of great fear and of great terror for the ungodly because God possesses that attribute. In fact, He told Moses, who was one of the most godly and righteous men of his day, He said, You cannot see Me, for no man can see Me and live. Even Moses, one of the most holy men, could not look at God because He said, You would die. You would be struck down dead if you saw Me. That's how pure God is. That's how holy God is. Deuteronomy 4, 24. All the way back in the Pentateuch. The, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. In Deuteronomy 4, 24. Listen to what is written here. It says, For the Lord your God 
is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Friends, I want to tell you something about fire that you probably already realized. You cannot touch fire. You can't stick your hand in a fire. Well, you could, but what's going to happen? It's going to burn you. It's going to, to consume your flesh in its flames. Fire is something, it is good, it is beneficial, but you cannot approach it. You cannot actually stick an appendage into fire. Otherwise, it's going to be severely burned. Severely burned. And that tells us something about God's character. That you cannot enter into God's presence without being just killed on the spot because God is so pure and God is so righteous. Any sinner, no one can enter into God's presence. Whether it is, it is the religious hypocrite, whether it is the self-righteous Pharisee, whether it is the liar or the thief or the homosexual, they cannot enter into God's presence because He is holy. He is a holy, righteous God. Another attribute of God is that God is love. God is abounding in loving kindness. Friends, I want you to know that the breeze that you, that you feel upon your face as you walk down the street is not meaningless. It testifies to God's love. That God has a, has a general love for His creation and bestows gracious gifts upon sinners even when they do not deserve it. Also, I want to point out to you another attribute of God, and that is that God is a just judge. See, because of God's holiness and because of God's righteousness... Would you like to support a Christian women's soccer team? Oh, I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you as well. Would you like a gospel track, ma'am? I'm good, thank you. Okay. God is a just judge. See, my friends, because of God's holiness, because of His personal purity and His righteousness, He must punish sin. Just like if, let's say for a moment, there was a judge here in Greenville County. The judge is obligated to punish those who break the law. So too it is with God. God is obligated to punish those who break His law. It's only His character. It's something He possesses intrinsically. He's jealous for His own holiness and His own glory. He's jealous for His own name's sake. He wants to vindicate His name. See, people trample God's name underfoot. They blaspheme God all the time. And God one day will punish the wicked and He will vindicate His holy name. He will vindicate His righteous name. Scripture says God dwells in unapproachable light. Scripture has many things to say concerning God's character. But I want to note to you that Scripture also reveals to us something else concerning God. And that is that He has given a law to obey. He has given us a law, His commandments, His Ten Commandments. Those of you who have a religious upbringing, perhaps you are familiar with the Ten Commandments. I ask you to recall in your memory those commands and to consider the character of God that is revealed in those commands. Consider those commandments. God said, you shall not lie. Why does God say that? It is because God is not a liar. He is true. His veracity, which he, which he possesses intrinsically, is perfect. He has no flaw in His truthfulness. Why does God say you shall not steal? Because He's not a thief. God is perfect in that way, in those respects. God bless you guys. Why does God say you shall not steal? You shall not commit adultery. He says things like you shall not fornicate. Why? Because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. I could go on and on. Why does God say you must keep the Sabbath day? Because God rested on the, the seventh day after creating the world. Not that He needed that, but He set that aside as, a, as, a, as an eternal institute. As an example unto His creation. And so that law reflects His perfect character. So my friends, the law of God reflects not only the character of God, but the, the character of fallen, sinful humanity. It reflects our character to us, but not in a good way as it does God's character, but in a, in a terrifying way, in a way that is bad, in that it brings bad news. Because it shows us that we ourselves are liars, that we are thieves, that we are blasphemers, that we are fornicators, we are idolaters, we're adulterers. The law of God reveals to us 
It reveals to us our sinful state. That's the reason God gave the Ten Commandments, dear friends. It's not so that you can be a moral, good Christian person and make your way to heaven by going to church and putting a smile on your face and keeping the Ten Commandments. That is not... If you have walked away from, from country Baptist preaching with that inclination, I apologize because that's not true. That is not true. The law of God is meant to show you one thing, that you cannot merit your way to God. You're not good enough to make it to heaven. You're not pleasing in God's eyes. And He is absolutely righteous and He will punish your sin. The law of God is meant to show us the righteousness of God and to show us that we have fallen short of that. And not just fallen short, but fallen way short. We have missed the mark in totality. We have sinned. Listen to the way Romans 3 describes sinful humanity. Listen to this in verse 10. As it is written, There is none righteous, there is not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. How true this is concerning sinful humanity. Consider this fact. That since 1973, in America we've slaughtered over 53 million unborn children in the womb. We've slaughtered as a nation 53 precious little children. And it's funny, there's all this talk about racism in the United States, all this talk, especially in light of what happened in Charlottesville. It's amazing because the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, hated black people and said we needed to get rid of all the black people because they were less evolved than the white people. And so if you want to get on a real social activist movement we need to stop abortion absolutely tomorrow we need to shut down every abortion clinic in the United States because most abortions are black children and Mexican children they're not white children most of them are black and Mexican that is a racist institution abortion is a racist institution and it is out of the pit of hell and it is an abomination in God's eyes and God hates abortion and hates abortion supporters and hates abortion doctors and he will judge them for their wickedness for slaughtering the unborn in their mother's womb do you know my friends nothing has changed the book of Ecclesiastes says that there is nothing new under the sun and guess what in biblical times the Israelites you know what they would do they would they would worship this false God and his name was Moloch. He was a demon God. He was a false God of the Canaanites. And Moloch, they would build these huge bronze statues of Moloch and they would have a man's torso and they would have it would have a, a bull's head and they would have the two arms extended and they'd have a hole in the chest and they would light a fire under this bronze statue and it would become molten hot. It would burn red hot and they would take their, their newborn children and they'd lay them on the arms of Moloch and they would burn alive. They would, the children would die as they are laid upon the, that demon God's arms and they, they are consumed in that fire. They did that in ancient Israel. And the reason they did that is they believed Moloch would give them prosperity in their, finance, in their finances and in their crops. They believed that Moloch, this God, if they sacrificed their children to this God, they would receive blessing. And my friends, the same reason do people slaughter their children today. Because they say, well, I don't have enough money. Or it's inconvenient. Or I don't know if I have the, 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 the means to take care of this child, so I'm just going to kill it. It's the same exact reasoning. Nothing is new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun, dear friends. And those demons are at work today. And so that's why the text says their feet are sh swift to shed blood. We are. As a nation, we spill the blood of innocent children. 4,000 babies a day in the United States are killed from abortion. We, uh, we do have feet that are swift to shed blood. 
But listen to what it says in verse 17. And the path of peace they have not known. Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why we live in a world of turmoil? Do you want to know why there's wars and rumors of wars all around us? It is because man is dead in sin and a hater of God and he needs to be saved through Jesus Christ. It is not because of politics. It's not because of finances. It's not because of an economy. It's because people are dead in sin. And only the gospel of peace can reconcile enemies one to another. Only the gospel of peace can bring peace to a war that is ravaged by war. That's the only way. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, if you want peace, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You'll have peace with God, peace in your soul, and peace with your fellow man. A threefold peace. He says in verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And how true that is that so, many, so few people fear God. So few people fear the consuming fire. God is a righteous and just God. And every time you sin against God, you're storing up for yourself wrath and judgment. And so my friends, as, we've, as, we've, as I've challenged you to consider those commands and as you consider them, we see that we've broken God's law and we see that we deserve His punishment for sin. We deserve to be punished for our sin. Just as a murderer, just as a thief here in Greenville deserves to be locked away in prison for breaking the law, so too does a sinner. When they break God's law, they deserve to be thrown into prison. But my friends, God's prison is a place called hell. And there's no parole and there's no release. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said hell is a place that is the unquenchable fire. It's the eternal fire. Jesus spoke on hell more than he did heaven because he wanted to warn sinners about going there. Don't die in your sins, dear friends. Hey, brother, how you doing? Did I see you somewhere last week? Yes, last week? A couple days ago? I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I don't come up here. Hardly. No, no. No, I don't shop in Simpsonville. Well, it's good to see you, though. Good to see you. Get some track star handing them out, brother. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, good. You've been here for a while. Awesome. So Jesus, my friends, warned people about hell. Listen to what he says about hell. In Mark chapter chapter 9 and verse 43, he says, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet than to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched if your eye causes you to stumble throw it out for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to enter into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched dear friends don't go to hell in your sins Jesus is the ark of salvation that will rescue you from the wrath which is to come and so we find ourselves in this helpless state we find ourselves in this hopeless state. All people does not matter. It does not matter who you are, where you're from, or where the color of your skin is. You've sinned against God. You need salvation. We're all on this equal plane of hopelessness outside of God's grace. We, are, we cannot merit a right standing before God. That would be like a murderer saying to a judge, Well, judge, listen, I've done good things in my life, so please let me off the hook doesn't work like that. Our guilt is there, friends. The guilt is there, and therefore the condemnation is there. And the condemnation is there, therefore we have no hope in and of ourselves. And that's why, as the text we're reading, homosexuals are condemned there without hope. Those who live in the sin of homosexuality, I care for you, and I want you to know that Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. He can save you from your sins and you can, be, you can be freed from slavery to sin. But nonetheless, all people, including homosexuals, as this text we're looking at reads, are on that equal plane of hopelessness before God. Without hope! 
But the Bible says in Galatians 4.4 4, that when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the Gospel. He is the good news. He is the light of the world. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the bread of life. He is everything, my friends. Christ is everything. He came into this world, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God-man. And He came and dwelt among men. And He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled those commands which we broke. Think about that for a moment. Jesus said in Matthew 5.17, He says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to, to live in submission and in obedience to the will of God to the uttermost in His perfect life. And then He was, he was beat and He was whipped and He was mocked. He was spat upon and He was nailed to a cross. He was nailed to a cross and He suffered on that cross for those hours under the wrath of Almighty God. At that cross, God the Father was pouring out His wrath on His Son. See, my friends, that's what hell is. It's not Satan with a pitchfork poking bad guys in the back. It's God Almighty unleashing His wrath upon sinners. But the cross of Jesus Christ is God taking that wrath that we deserve to be put on ourselves and He pours it on His Son on behalf of His elect people. Christ died for His bride and for His people. He died on that cross and made intercession for the transgressors. At the cross, He was forsaken and abandoned by God at that cross. Do you realize the significance of this? What is hell? What is the terror and horror of hell? It is to be abandoned, to be cut off from the grace and mercy of God for all eternity. And Christ comes and, it, and is cut off from the grace of God and from the, the presence of the Almighty on that cross. And He pays the infinite price. Listen to the words of, of Mark 15. It says in Mark 15, 34, it says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the cross, the Father unleashed upon His Son the full fury of His wrath. My friends, the cross is not just some example. It's not just showing us, well, God doesn't like when we sin. It is, a, it is a legal payment for sin. It is a substitutionary atonement. It is Christ paying for the sins of His people. That is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ is God saving His people from their sins. Listen to Isaiah 53.10. It says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him, if putting Him to grief. If He would render Himself as a guilt offering, He will see His offspring. He will prolong His days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in His hand. Christ at the cross satisfied the wrath of God. And He died there as a sacrifice for sin. That's significant. Listen to this also in going back to Mark 15. This is very, very significant. In Mark 15, this is right after Jesus dies. Right after Jesus cries out. It says in verse 37, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed His last. Now listen to verse 38. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Let me, let me tell you something. In Israel, in ancient Israel, they had the temple. The Israelites worshipped God in the temple. And in the temple, there was this inner room. It was called the Holy of Holies. It was where God's Spirit was said to dwell. God's glory was in this room. And once a year, the, the high priest on the day which is called Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into this inner room of this temple and would offer a sacrifice to God and would sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant. And if he were to sin inside as he's in that room, God would strike him dead immediately. If he would do the slightest thing that was wrong, God would strike him dead immediately. And so legend says that they would put bells on the robes of the priests, and when they would fall down, the bells would make a noise, and they would pull them out. They would actually tie a rope around his foot, make him walk in, and so if he fell down dead, they could drag him out by rope. Because they didn't dare walk in God's presence. 
See, God is separated. We are separated from Him. There is a barrier there. It is our unholiness. But listen to what the cross of Jesus Christ does. What does the text say? Verse 38. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now this veil wasn't some thin linen sheet. It wasn't like a napkin. This thing was four, somewhere anywhere between four to six inches thick. That's like a Subway sandwich thick. This was not something you could just wiggle around and it would rip apart. There had to be such a massive, strong force that ripped this thing apart from top to bottom. And that's what happened. When Jesus died, the veil of the temple was rent. It was ripped from top to bottom. And what that is, what that displayed to us is that the barrier is gone. The sin of God's people is removed by the death of the Son of God. Mark 1.1 1, 1 says, It is the gospel of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is the work of Christ to bring us to God, to bring us into a right standing with God. And after, after laying in that tomb three days, He is raised on the third day from the grave. God exalts Him. He raises His Son up as Mark 16 testifies, as the end of Matthew says, as the end of Luke, as the end of John, all four of the Gospels in unison testify that Jesus Christ was raised on the third day. In fact, not only was He raised on the third day, but He foretold this. Listen to what it says in Mark 9. Verse 31, it says, For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Christ foretold it, and he did it. After 40 days of further ministry, he was exalted in glory. And that is where he's seated now, at the right hand of God, at the right hand of majesty on high, as the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, the book of Hebrews says that he lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through him. And so here is what you must do, O oh sinner. Here is what you must do, my friends, my dear friends. Listen, this is what you must do. You must repent and believe the gospel. Flee your sin. Flee your sins. And trust all alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can be reconciled to God. No priest, no pope, no pastor, no prayers, no anything, no penance can reconcile. No other P words can make you right with God. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's only through the mediator of the new covenant. Jesus told His disciples on that night before He was to be killed, He says this is, and He takes the cup of wine, He gives it to them, and He says this symbolizes the blood of the new covenant. Christ Christ enacted a new covenant in His own blood. And so, my friends, repent. Flee your sins. Flee your, your selfishness, your lying, your blasphemy, your thievery, your hatred, your lovelessness. You have a, a lack of love in your hearts toward one another and toward God. Flee this wickedness. Flee your homosexuality. Flee your perversion. Flee your adultery and your fornication. Flee your pornography. Because God sees your web browsing history, friends. You can delete it, but God keeps a record of it. He sees it. Everything is laid bare before His eyes. He keeps a record of it. And He will punish you. He'll punish you if your eye causes you to stumble. Why did Jesus say, pluck even your own eye out? Because this is a serious thing. Your soul is at stake, friends. We're on the precipice of eternity. And we're all standing on a cliff and every moment there are people stepping off and standing before God. Every day, 150,000 people die and stand before God. My friends, today could be your day. Repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved from your sins. Listen to what Romans three or Romans four five says. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. God is in the business, my friends, of reconciling sinners to himself through the finished work of Jesus Christ. But it is only through Christ his Son. It is only through Christ. He is the only way. There is no other way of salvation but through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. So my friends, believe. And not just, not just possess some superficial faith. Not just some surface belief in Christ. 
but a genuine trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. A genuine trust in what Christ has done for you. Yeah. Believing She's great. that He died for your sin and was raised on the third day. Believing that with all your heart. Okay. And if you do that, if you believe the gospel, here is the promise of the gospel. Here's the promise. Your sin will be forgiven you. You will be forgiven of all your sins on the merit of Christ's uh, death. Listen, friends, forgiveness before God is not light. So many people think, well, God's merciful, God's kind, so He's going to forgive me and I'm going to go to heaven. If you take God's forgiving you so lightly, you know absolutely nothing of God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness cost Him so much. It cost God so much that He sent His only Son, His only Son whom He loved. Think about the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross. The forgiveness that a, that a sinner receives through the precious work of Christ is not light and it is not something that is taken lightly. That's why if you claim to be a Christian and you don't live in accordance to the truth of the gospel and you, are, you remain unchanged and in your sin, yet you say, because I prayed a prayer or I walked an aisle or I had a religious experience that I'm a Christian, you're a hypocrite, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. If you say you know Christ... But you do not live as though Jesus gave you a law to obey. You are not in Christ. If you say you're a Christian, what you're saying is, I follow after Christ. I follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't say it if you don't actually do it actually follow after Christ. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. Salvation is a free gift of grace. But the evidence of conversion, the evidence of being regenerated by the grace of God is that your life will be changed. You will be a new creation. What's the Bible say? 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Salvation is not caused by your work, but it is evidenced by your work. Our deeds evidence our salvation. They are not the cause, but they are the result. So you will be forgiven of your sins if you repent and believe the gospel, and God will credit you with having lived the life that Jesus Christ lived. God will credit you with having lived Christ's life. And you will be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. You will be justified on the merits of Christ. God will count you as having lived His life. That's the exchange of the Gospel. Christ takes my sin and I get His righteousness. Christ takes my filth and I get His perfect seamless garment of righteousness. You, God brother. bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you guys. God bless you. Thank you. My friends, that's the exchange of the Gospel. What a deal. We see all the time going down the street, advertisement after advertisement. Check out this deal. This is a good deal. Whether it be food or clothing or whatever, the greatest of deal. The greatest deal you'll ever find is found in the Gospel. God offers you righteousness freely. Free of charge. So come and grab hold of the salvation that Christ has made available. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved from your sins. And my friends, this is all done. This is all ordered to bring God glory. So give God the glory, friends. Give God the glory for the great things that He has done. This is all to the end that God might be glorified. Give God the glory, friends. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He has done. Give Him the glory, friends. And if you're a Christian, rest in the Gospel this very evening. Be encouraged in your soul and preach this and preach it until you die. Share it. Feed upon it. It is your daily bread and your daily manna. And you as well, give God glory. All of you give God the glory. All creation testifies of the glory of God. Praise the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. To God be the glory indeed. Indeed and indeed. So we've seen here in Romans 1, 26 and 27, that the sin of homosexuality, the sin 
of homosexuality is something which is an abomination to God. It is something that goes against nature and goes against God's revealed will. But it is something, oh my friends, it is something that the power of the Lord Jesus Christ can overcome. The grace of Jesus Christ is great, much greater than the greatest of sin and the greatest of sinners. Dear friends, do not forget this. Look to Christ, whether you are in this particular sin or not. Look to the Son of God. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Give the Lord Jesus Christ the glory, the God of glory. Indeed. I want to leave off with these words from Romans 11. As Paul says in Romans 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen.